um, a computer program from the point of view of the computer, it's a machine language. And so the reason that we think we call our computers digital computers is that the mathematical world that they live in is the world of, the, of integers, of natural numbers. And a computer program for such a machine is just a long list of numbers. The, some of these numbers would be interpreted as commands to tell the machine what to do, and others are data which will manipulate. And if you go back far enough in time and you have the job of being a computer programmer, your name, your, your task is to um, write down this long list of numbers which corresponds to a task you actually want your computer to do. And if you're particularly unfortunate, you'll be writing this list of numbers down in binary using a bunch of uh, switches on the front panel of your machine. We can make this slightly more user friendly by switching to assembly language, which is just the same list of, of numbers, but now instead of writing them down in binary, we can write them in ASCII. But this is just the same thing in a slightly more readable form. Around 1952, uh, Grace Hopper has the idea that instead of the programmer being responsible for translating their intention into the language of the machine, perhaps the machine could do the translation itself. And this gives the idea, first of all, that we should have high level programming languages that humans can understand. So here is a COBOL program, one of the earliest languages designed to be understandable by humans. And I think even though you might not know this language, um, it's pretty easy to understand what this program is trying to do. Uh, and now the programmer has the ability to write something that is easy to read, and they rely on the software called the compiler to generate the machine code to do this translation into the binary language for the computer. Okay, so to recap what I just said, compiler's job is to translate a high-level language intended for human consumption, and I'm ironically going to call that language C, and translate it into a binary language which is suitable for the machine to consume. Of course, every different kind of computer has its own binary language, and they're usually not compatible with each other. Now, if we look inside the, uh, the compiler, which is the, the purple box on my, my slide, we can see that it has a lot of different um, subprocesses inside it. And compilers nowadays are very complicated systems, and this can be quite a complicated process. And if we look a bit more closely at these different subprocesses inside the compiler, we can observe a couple of things. The first thing is that the stages near the beginning of the process depend very much on the programming language which the compiler is going to start from. So the input language will have to be lexed, parsed, we might want to check the types and so on. This depends on the language itself. Um, at the back end of the compiler, we see lots of phases which depend on the machine, which will be the target machine, whose machine code we're going to be generating. And so that will be depending on the specific binary words will be generated, how many registers the machine has, what is the, um, the linking policy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and in the middle, we see a bunch of phases which don't really depend on the language and also don't really depend on the machine. And this we think of as the intermediate phase, and it really encodes what's the logical structure of the program in terms of the, of the data flow inside the program. And so almost all modern compiler systems take advantage of this structure to separate these three phases out. And the best known example of this is the LLVM. And so the LLVM is a modular system where you can um, add, so the core of the LLVM is this intermediate representation, which makes it easy to transform programs. And you can easily add to it new front ends to support new programming languages or new back ends to support new hardware. And a lot of the clever stuff is all happening in the middle, completely independent of both sides. 
So when we designed Ticket, this the idea was to steal this concept. So we have many front ends, so you can write programs in many languages, and you can generate um, quantum programs for lots of different possible hardware, hardware and also simulators. So I'm not going to speak much more about the, the details of, of the system, um, but that's the, the meaning of the phrases language agnostic and retargetable. And of course, the other word that I used in my initial slide was NISC. And I'm going to guess that everybody in this audience knows the term uh, NISC. It's an abbreviation for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. My usual summary of what this actually means is not many qubits and they suck. Um, but let's try to be more precise about that. Um, so by intermediate scale, we mean 50 to 100 qubits. And so these machines are just starting to become available. I think there's a, there's a few of them around the world at the moment. At 50 qubits, it starts to become classically intractable to, to simulate these kinds of computations on a classical computer. Um, there, this is obviously a moving barrier, but that's roughly where it starts to become too difficult. Um, so this means we can start to run things which are hopefully useful that we couldn't otherwise do. Now, on the other side, this number of qubits is really not enough for error correction. So the, the errors in the system we'll just have to live with. And there are also other, um, say, more ad hoc restrictions on how these machines might be used. So here is an example of a, let's say, a sub-NISC computer, the IBM Q Melbourne. It was originally a 16-qubit device when it was rolled out. Um, on this particular day, when I took the screenshot, there was only 14 functioning qubits. And you can see in this picture um, the, the graph of the architecture of this machine. So there are, as I said, the 14 qubits are represented by the 14 circles. And the edges between them show which qubits can talk to each other. Because we can't do necessarily two qubit gates in every position on the machine. I have to actually have a physical coupling between the qubits and only in those positions can I do a two qubit gate. The other thing which you can see here, which is important for this story, is the error rates. So these are noisy machines, their operations are prone to error. And in some cases, the error rate can be quite high. We see that in the, the worst examples in this machine, um, the C0 error rate is around 10%. That's pretty bad, um, uh, and it varies by about an order of magnitude from the best to the worst. One other thing to note about these kinds of machines is that this is not stable. The error rates will change over time. Uh, and so in the case of IBM, I think they recalibrate their machines every 12 hours and update this, this information. Uh, Okay, and so in terms of our, our compiler, we want to be able to use this information where we can, but the perhaps most pressing thing is to realize that we have a really hard limit with these kinds of machines of what can be achieved um, within acceptable noise. So the T1 and T2 times are basically uh, components of the lifetime of your qubit. So if we look at two examples here, um, the zero qubit has T1 just short of 30 microseconds, whereas its neighbor next door has a T1 of more like 100 microseconds. So the T qubit zero is a pretty rubbish qubit, or at least it is on this particular day. And if we compare the coherence times with the length of time that it takes to do a two qubit gate, which is in this example varying from 170 to 391 nanoseconds, we can calculate that roughly we can do 66 C0 gates before we run out of co coherence in this device. So if we're going to be compiling software, we're going to have to work very hard to make sure that our um, software can finish executing inside this very narrow time window. 
Um, so that's something that the compiler will try to take care of, but this has bigger consequences. If we look into a textbook such as Nielsen and Chuang, especially older books, we might see an algorithm like this. So this is the circuit for phase estimation. And the idea here is that I have a input state, uh, psi, and I wish to extract some property of it up to some precision using this, this schematic circuit. It doesn't really matter what the, um, the blue boxes are, they're just controlled circuits. And so we might be able to extract three bits of precision from this, uh, of this property using this circuit. But if three bits of precision is not enough, maybe I want four bits of precision. And so I can add another qubit and I can add another block of controlled gates. Um, but if I want to have another bit, I can repeat the process. And so now I have five bits of precision, but my circuit got bigger again. And in general, every time I want one more bit of precision, I have to pay one more qubit, but unfortunately roughly a doubling of the circuit depth. And since we know that the coherence time is finite, these kinds of algorithms are not practical for, for NISC devices. Um, and a, bit, a thing that I didn't mention is that I also have to prepare this state in the first place. So the cost of getting to Psi should be included in my, my runtime as well. So for these reasons, people don't usually consider algorithms like this for NISC machines, and instead we think about hybrid algorithms. Roughly speaking, what this means is that we have a relatively small quantum circuit here called the ANSATS, which has some parameters theta. And we'll run this circuit starting from a known initial state and do a variety of measurements on the end of it. And then we'll um, combine these measurements to compute some quantity of interest, which I'm going to call E. And usually the game is we will want the minimum E. And so armed with our estimate of what E is with our current parameters, we can update those parameters and try again and keep going until we've actually reached the minimum value of E, which will accept to be our answer. So these are, this kind of algorithm is quite different to the, um, the classic quantum algorithms like Shor and Crowford. So these are the kind of things that we need to be able to compile with our software. So um, what is NISC? Um, let's say it's a small number of gates. These NISC computers are effectively analog. So we have a universal gate set available to us. So we don't need to worry about trying to construct the uh, particular rotation gates we want out of discrete gates like T gates, uh, which is the case that we would need to concern ourselves with if we were living in a fault tolerant setting. Um, we're not in a fault tolerant setting. So in particular, we have no error correction. So everything that we do will introduce errors in the uh, in, in the computation, which we're going to have to deal with as part of our um, software. Um, because the coherence times of our qubits tend to be relatively short, we are very much concerned with reducing the circuit depth. Now, even if I'm thinking about machines which are based on, for example, ion traps, which have really good coherence times, the gates are still noisy, so we want to do as few of them as possible. Um, oftentimes, we have to deal with this restricted qubit connectivity that I mentioned, and we have variation in the performance of the components across the machine. And so laying out the circuit on the machine can have a major effect on the fidelity. Okay, so that's NISC machines. That's the kind of environment that we're working in, and that's the um, kind of software we need to compile and the kind of hardware it needs to target. So let's think a little bit more about what are the phases in quantum compilation. So in my, my classical compiler, I had the language dependent phase, the language and a machine independent phase in the intermediate zone and a machine dependent phase. So if I go into the quantum world, you can see the same kind of thing happening. So we'll have a language dependent phase. Now some of this I'm just going to completely ignore, right? The lexing, parsing, type checking things that feature in a real compiler, uh, we're not going to discuss here at all because I don't have a complicated programming language in mind here that would require all of these things. The main goal of the front end of the compiler 
is circuit synthesis to just generate an initial attempt at a quantum circuit for what you want to do. So hopefully we have a nice high level language which can express what you're trying to do, maybe a domain specific language for your problem, or more likely with today's technology, you'll have to specify your circuit directly, um, either just by writing down the list of gates in something like Chasm or writing a, a program in some other language, but which is basically not a specification of the circuit you're trying to write down. But the first phase is, is always ending up with some attempt at a circuit. Uh, if we move forwards, we could see a, a machine independent phase where we are trying to optimize the circuit. Now, in this context, when I say circuit optimization, I mean make the circuit as small as possible. Um, I remember some years ago, I had a guest lecturer in my software engineering class. And he said that uh, as a software engineer, his job is to write code. And writing code is the same thing as writing bugs. Uh, in quantum uh, software, we have a similar scenario, whereas we're doing gates. And whenever we're doing gates, we're doing noise. So we want to do as few gates as possible to achieve the, uh, the desired result. Um, so we make our circuit as small as possible using this optimization phase. And then we may want to do what's called noise shaping to try and reconfigure the circuit to make it as noise resistant as possible. Now, this is not necessarily an independent, but in many techniques for noise shaping can be done without detailed knowledge of the machine. As we move forward, we then go into the more machine specific things. So every machine in practice has a limited number of gates that it actually can do. And so before we can um, evaluate, enough, we need to convert the gates that we have in the circuit. In and then want to do qubit mapping, which is the process I alluded to earlier, where we re so the um, logical qubits of my circuit are now mapped onto the physical qubits of the of this of the machine, and the gates have to occur where the machine has couplings. And finally, after that, there is this control phase where this um, circuit described gets can be mapped into um, control pulses. Or, or laser instructions. And this will be very much dependent on the exact hardware you could build the machine. So I've schematically colored these boxes to try and indicate which things are relying on the machine, which things are relying on the language, which things are independent. But unlike the world of classical compilation, these boundaries are really fluid and a lot of the work that we've been working in CQC recently has been trying to move things from the qubit mapping layer into the circuit synthesis layer um, because one can achieve better results that way. So you don't need to take this, um, this schema too seriously, but I think it's useful to have in mind the idea that some parts of this process are independent. Of... Ross, sorry for interrupting. Yes. Uh, we, we just lost your screen share. Could you share oh. it again? Nothing has changed at my end. Let me. Uh, let I me think try your, again. your your internet connection was very weak, and that may have caused the screen share to be dropped. So I'm stopping sharing. So maybe you can see my face now, uh, and I'll try sharing again. And is that better? So on my end, I, I see the screen. See something. Yeah, I okay. see the quantum compiler. Phases. Okay, so then it's just my problem. Okay, so then please go ahead and I will try to reconnect. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Okay, great, no problem. Um, okay, so I think what I was just saying was that it's useful to remember that some things depend on the machine and some things don't. And, uh, I, I, and we can use that to our advantage. Uh, one part that I didn't um, 
we'll talk about, which isn't really relevant in the classical phase, is that all of this stuff will be wrapped up in a runtime. Because as, a, as we're dealing with hybrid algorithms, we always have this, this optimization phase, but a lot of the, the things that we want to do, for example, if we're estimating a Hamiltonian, we want to amalgamate the statistics we get out of the machine in different ways. If we're doing noise mitigation techniques, we need to post-process the results in different ways. And there's no particular reason why the programmer should be responsible for doing that, right? Um, and so this is the general, the general setup of what a, a quantum compiler has to deal with. Um, okay, so I will press on to the topic of circuits. So I guess everyone knows what a quantum circuit is. I have a bunch of qubits and I act on them with unitary operators, which we call gates. Okay. And when we're talking about um, circuit optimization, the idea here is that every circuit corresponds to a unitary map in the ideal case, but in the real world, they might have different properties. So if we see these two circuits on the uh, on the screen now, they are the same unitary map, but you can see the one on the left obviously has fewer gates and fewer two qubit gates, and um, the shortest path through it uh, is also shorter. And so the idea here is that we want to, whenever possible, replace a circuit which is better with respect to some property. And, we, and one way of doing this is using rewriting rules and, and equational theories. So you might have heard this under the term peephole optimization. The idea is that I just look locally at some part of the circuit. Uh, here are some examples we might consider. And I replace this local sub-circuit with a better one. So some of these rules are very easy to work out. Like if I have two Z gates in a row, I should just replace them with nothing. If I have two C nodes in a row, I should yeah. replace them with nothing. If I have this particular configuration of, of C nodes, I can do a, that's effectively a swap, which it may be easier to do in a different way, uh, and so on. So using these kinds of, of rewrite rules, we can transform our circuit into something um, smaller. Yeah, so the point, this, this last bullet point on my slide uses some computer science technology, which I'm sure that not all of you will know. Um, so when I say this set of rewrites is terminating, if I just look at these rules, you can see that in each case, I've got fewer gates after the rewrite than I had before. So this means that I can do this, these rules in any order and eventually I'll stop because I'm, I'm always getting a smaller circuit. But the order in which I apply the rules does actually matter for which circuit I'll get at the end. And therefore, if you want to have the best um, optimization, you have to have a clever way of applying these rules in order to make sure you get to the smallest um, terminating point and not, the, uh, and not a larger one. So in general, we don't have to use the language of quantum circuits like you see on this slide. Um, we're really talking about linear maps and there are lots of different ways to write down linear maps. So quantum circuits is one way, uh, tensor networks is another way, and, uh, and there are more. And so inside the world of um, of compilers, we can think about what's the most appropriate representation of the circuit for the optimization technique that I want to apply. And so one that we're very fond of in CQC is this language here, which is called the ZX calculus. It, it's a tensor network language with a very well-behaved um, rewriting theory. And it's based on the theory of Hopf algebras. So I won't go really into any details here, but this using this switch of perspective from circuits to, to ZX terms or to other um, representations of linear maps can let us do lots of things. So inside Ticket, we have many different ways to, to represent quantum circuits. And one thing which I want to briefly mention is um, a very common structure we see in circuits used for chemistry. So this um, circuit here you see 
is uh, UCC SD and SATs for computing the ground state energy of hydrogen. And what you will notice all the way through this circuit is this repeating structure of this ladder of C0 gates and then a phase shift and then a ladder of C0 gates going back again. And so if we use our ZX language, we can do this translation. And I won't go through what the translation is. I think the picture is pretty self-explanatory. But using the, the equations that I showed you a couple of slides ago, I can rewrite this into something else. And I will go like this. So this is a new kind of operator, uh, which we call the phase gadget. And it's, you know, it's exactly equivalent to the one that you see above. Um, and actually, if I can rewrite it in different notation, we can see that it corresponds to an operator like this. And with that uh, notation, I can then generalize it to what we call the Pauli gadget. Okay, so this Pauli gadget thing we use a lot. And it has also a nice rewriting theory, which is relatively simple. Okay, there's going to be two slides worth of equations, just these two, but they're actually very simple equations. And so we can use this concept of, of um, Pauli gadget as a more um, expressive or powerful gate than the usual kind of gates that we find in, in textbooks. And we use this in the world of, of ANSATS synthesis. So here's my picture of a hybrid algorithm again. And what is actually happening in our quantum computer is this part, right? And the, the measurements will just be one qubit measurements almost all the time, so they're not so interesting. But we should focus on the ANSATS, which is this quantum circuit here. Uh, broadly speaking, in quantum algorithms, there are two kinds of ANSATS. There are physically motivated ones, which are well behaved and easy to reason about, but tend to be very deep circuits. Uh, and there are the hardware efficient ones, which have not so great convergence properties, uh, don't have any particular little relations that we're trying to solve, um, but have the benefit of very shallow circuits. So what we'd like to do is to try and find some way of turning these physically motivated ANSATs into shallow circuits, right? And so the thing, the place where we started is with this UCC ANSATs, and this is the basic setup of the ANSATs here. But the important thing to, to see is that we're basically starting from some easy to prepare initial state, and we're applying a unitary map to it. And the unitary map has this form here. It's a product of, uh, sorry, it's an exponential of, of Pauli's. And I hope that's something familiar to you from what I showed a few slides ago. So in this case, we're not going to start from a circuit, right? We're going to start from this expression, uh, which we can get from looking at the, the translation of some chemistry problem into, into language of qubits. And so in the case of this compilation strategy I'm talking about, we look at this, um, this set of terms here, and we organize them into commuting sets, which we can then simultaneously diagonalize. And we use our, our Pauli gadget framework to do this. And on the inside of every such Pauli gadget, there is a, a phase polynomial. And then we can synthesize circuits for those directly. I'm not going to go into too much details of this because it will take too long. If you want to know more, um, there will be a talk on Wednesday at IWQC, uh, which you can hear more about it. But it performs very well, about an order of magnitude better than a naive strategy for, for doing this kind of things. Um, so that's the, the archive number. Oh, I should have changed this slide. IWQC is not next week. IWQC is this week. It is, uh, it's on Tuesday. Sorry, it's on Wednesday and Thursday. So your summer school should be finished by then. Uh, and this is very, very efficient. OK, um, how am I doing for time? Not, not disastrous. So I want to talk then briefly about this um, circuit mapping task, which was not really properly explained earlier. So the next, here's a quantum circuit, right? Five, five qubits, a whole bunch of gates. And let's suppose that I want to run it on my old friend, IBM Melbourne. 
Um, IBM Melbourne has 14 qubits today, so we can easily fit this five qubit circuit onto the machine, and we have a lot of choices about where to do it. Uh, and we have a problem, however. If we look at this circuit, particularly if we look at this qubit that, that I've highlighted, the fourth qubit, we can see that this qubit has to interact with all of the other qubits. Uh, and unfortunately, in Melbourne, there is no qubit in the graph which has four neighbors. So this circuit, as we've described it, can't be run on Melbourne. So this is the, what we call the problem of qubit mapping. More generally, if we have any circuit C, and we have what's called an architecture, which is for our purposes an undirected graph, where the vertices are the qubits, and the edges represent where the couplings between the qubits are. The, uh, the problem of uh, qubit mapping can be said to try to find a placement of the uh, circuit onto the architecture. And when I say a placement, what I really mean is an injective function from the qubits of the circuit to the qubits of the architecture. And to avoid um, overburdening the word qubit too much, I'll call those physical qubits nodes in the architecture. Okay, so how should we choose our placement? Ideally, we'd like to use the best qubits, and there are different criteria for best here. We have longest coherence time, or the lowest gate error, or the lowest measurement error. And which of those criteria is most appropriate um, will actually depend a bit on your program. And the other important thing, more important in general, is that the two qubit gates should use the best couplings available. As we saw earlier, the couplings between the qubits are all of different fidelities, some better, some are a lot worse. However, in practice, the, uh, the biggest improvement is by arranging that the circuit requires the fewest swaps to implement. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But I wanted to show you a quick chart showing the difference that using fidelity information in the placement algorithm can make. So this is a chart from our, our paper where we described the ticket. And the x-axis is the number of gates in some randomly generated circuits that we use as a test. And the y-axis is the Jensen-Shannon divergence from the ideal noiseless simulation of these circuits. So this is being run on the, on the Melbourne device that I mentioned earlier. And what you can see is that if I have my, if I have a very naive placement, then I'm getting rather poor uh, performance at quite low gate counts. If I use a placement which tries to minimize the, um, the number of swaps, then my performance improves quite a lot. But then if I additionally use noise awareness, which is what the NA stands for here, then the circuit performance again improves quite a lot. Effectively, I can double the depth of my circuit or the gate count of my circuit without um, degrading the performance in terms of fidelity. So that's uh, a sign that uh, taking account of noise in your compilation can lead to really big benefits. Okay, but here's our, our real problem. Uh, it's called the routing problem. So I try to place my circuit on the architecture, but I can't. And the problem is that at some particular time step in the circuit, there is a pair of qubits which need to interact, but they're not adjacent to each other in the architecture. Okay, so the procedure we call routing is to insert swaps into the circuit so that the qubits which need to interact come closer together so they can interact. Now, a swap gate in most machines costs three C naughts. And C naughts are rather expensive. So we want to do this optimally, but as a combinatorial problem, it's NP hard. Um, and the NP hard problem is actually just to do it for one time step. So you want to do it globally across the whole time sequence of the circuit. That's actually harder again. This process will always um, increase the depth of your circuit. And there is a lower bound that says that in the 
worst best case, then you should see a logarithmic increase in depth where um, n is the number of qubits in your circuit. Um, so what does this look like? Where we're going to split the circuit into time steps, and each time step is the maximum set of gates which can all happen at the same time. And then when we move from one slice to the next, we might need to insert a, uh, a sorting network to move the qubits around so that were not adjacent before can become adjacent. And so that might look like this, and can try them. Um, so we know that in general, for any particular time step, the worst case is that we'll need n squared swaps. So that's very, uh, very expensive. And of course, at any given um, time step, we'll have a choice of multiple swaps. So on the left-hand side, I see um, my my placement and the the red lines are gates that I want to do but are not allowed by my placement. And the blue line indicates a swap that I'm considering as a good candidate to do next. So I can look at the effects of both of these swaps and update my placement. Uh, and you see that if I do this first one, I can execute one of my two desired gates, but not the other. And in this case, I will be able to do both of them. So clearly, the compiler should prefer this one. So in general, we use a heuristic method because exact solutions are too expensive. And we select, we score all the candidates based on a distance metric on how many things we can do. And then we select the best one. And uh, in ticket, we use a, an amount of look ahead, which depends on some pre-tuned hyperparameters for the given architecture we're looking at. So this is the outcome of the process. I have my original circuit. And what I get out of the, the mapping process is an initial placement of the qubits, an updated circuit where I've added all the swaps in, and then a final placement of the qubits. Um, so our method is good. Could you please finish within, let's say, two or three minutes to allow enough time for questions? Ah, I am just about there. Perfect. So we can see in the slide that uh, if we compare it to a much more naive method used by Qiskit, that we are improving quite considerably um, on the depth of the circuits, on, on different architectures. And it's interesting to note how much of an overhead you get on different architectures. These are the two ones that I showed you in the previous slides, and they are um, giving us with ticket an overhead of about 1.5. If the architecture was more highly connected, you might expect to see a better overhead than that. Okay, I just want to wrap up by thinking about what things that I think you all should be working on in your, in your research if you want to think about how to improve quantum compilers. And I've alluded to some of them all already. So the first thing is what actually are the right concepts for quantum software? So this is a, a very broad question. But I don't think a for loop which generates a bunch of gates is a very helpful concept. And in the world of classical computing, it's taken generations to arrive at concepts which are helpful. And we are a long way from that in quantum software. We are still basically at the level of the assembly program that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So the other thing is why we don't want to, to write down circuits. So how do we synthesize low depth circuits directly from higher level abstractions which talk about the problems we care about? And how do we do this maybe bringing into the question architecture awareness at an earlier stage? For reasons of mitigating noise, it's often helpful to program below the gate level at the analog layer. And I think a lot of people later on in school will talk about this level as well. And how do we best control um, errors and noise throughout this whole software stack because there's lots of different places in this environment where you can add error mitigation or noise management. 
So I just want to end with something I briefly alluded to, is that simultaneously this week there is a workshop happening. And in particular, if you're interested in compilers, on Wednesday and Thursday, there is the International Workshop for Quantum Compilation. Go to this web address, and you'll receive all the details. All right, thank you for your attention on that day. Thank you very much, Danke, uh, Ross, for this uh, really exciting talk and uh, for challenging the students uh, with a couple of things that they should really be thinking about. Um, we had a first question from Alistair. Hi. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Ah, I'm muted. Uh, no, it's fine. Ah, you can hear me. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so I guess my first question was, uh, can you recommend like a good category theory textbook? I started looking into it recently, um, but it would be, yeah, it'd be interesting if you have like a good suggestion for someone who knows a bit about theoretical physics, a bit about computer science, but kind of wants to learn more. Um, yeah, it's difficult to recommend just one book. So if you, if you care about um, just general category theory, uh, Tom Leinster's book, Basic Category Theory, is very good. And if you want to know more about how this might map into the quantum world, um, there is the book, I think it's called Categorical Quantum Mechanics by Jamie Vickery and Chris Heinen. And there's also another book called Picturing Quantum Processes by Bob Kuka and Alice Kissinger, which is secretly about category theory but it suppresses most of it in favor of this um, diagrammatic presentation. And uh, I guess my second question might be a bit stupid, but um, say that I want to produce like an efficient low level program using LLVM, then I need like, the types to be available to the compiler in order for it to make optimizations. Does ZX Calculus provide something similar for quantum compilation? So if I can kind of think about making a quantum circuit and then maybe for steps in the quantum circuit making the zx calculus type available so that like a quantum compiler can go can kind of like streamline it is that a way of thinking about it or is that stupid types are maybe not the right right concept but something that would make sense would be to transform a circuit into a zx term do a lot of simplifications which are possible in that language and transforms that term back into something you can execute, which would probably be again a circuit. So that last step is definitely the, the hardest, hardest thing to do because a lot of things that you need in a quantum circuit, like a well-defined causal order, are not really there in ZX calculus. But you have the same things that you think about tensor networks as well. So it's a case of, of thinking about what the correct translations are. I don't know if that helps or not. Yeah, I think it does. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Uh, I don't see any further questions in the chat, but of course, if something has come to mind, you can also still make yourself us. Federico, please go ahead. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I know this is a... Uh pretty, if not difficult question, but uh, one that doesn't have a clear answer. But from your experience when looking at compiling these NISC, uh, so VQE, QAOA type algorithms, um, what is the tri trade off between better uh, connectivity and more noise? So which, which direction does one want to go, say? Uh, if you have fixed frequency qubits uh, in the in these IBM chips, do you want better connectivity at the cost of more noise between the qubits and or the other way around? Yeah, I mean this is a number which depends quite sensitively on the on the actual parameters. Um, historically, and I think this is the direction of travel that IBM is certainly going in. Um, more connectivity means much worse crosstalk errors. And if you think back a couple of years, there was the Tokyo architecture, 
it was a very highly connected device and the noise in that device was just terrible. And IBM have, have certainly moved away from that to, to devices with much lower connectivity and much higher performance. I mean, obviously, if you get down to having your qubits in just a single line, then you're going to have too much routing overhead to do very much. But there's definitely a, a sweet spot. OK, thank you. Thanks for the great talk. I can only join Federico in that. Um, are there, is there one final question to us? If not, you know that you will also have the chance uh, to, to still ask him in our uh, coffee break after the, the second morning talk. And if there's no urgent question, I suggest that we um, move ahead and uh, come to the second morning talk, which will be given by Maria Schult. And she will talk about something that is really very, very closely related uh, to optimal control. And that is uh, machine learning. And uh, specifically, she will talk about quantum machine learning. Uh, just one second before starting. I need to stop this recording and start a new one. Okay. Otherwise... Shall I